the 16th season of the Nitwits, a weekly roundtable discussion on the Penn State Nittany Lions. Our panel includes Neil Riddell of the Altoona Mirror, Mark Brennan of FightOnState.com, Sports Director Casey Cans of WTAJ Sports, and a special guest analyst each week. The Nitwits are brought to you by Irwin Financial Raymond James, an independent firm and firm foundation for your financial future. Coldwell Banker, no one will work harder to sell your home. By Doctors Howells and Reed, orthodontics for children and adults. By Pacifico's Bakery, genuine Italian bread and rolls for your tailgating needs. By Fiori True Value on 6th Avenue and Altoona, just ask rental. By the Altoona Professional Hearing Aid Center, your hearing aid healthcare professional. By Monarch Cleaners, for all your cleaning needs. By your rehab choice, Health South of Altoona, ask for us by name. By JP Auto, home of the $1,000 push, pull, or tow. By Courtesy Motors of Altoona, where courtesy means a great deal. By the Allegro, where fine cuisine is a way of life. By easytouse.com, your Yellow Pages connection in print and online. By fightonstate.com, as close as you get to Penn State football without putting on a helmet. And by the Altoona Mirror, featuring Penn State game day every Friday. Welcome to a special edition of the Nitwits. We've got the gang all here. Neil Riddell from the Altoona Mirror, former Penn Stater Jonas Stassi from FightOnState.com, the great Mark Brennan. Please, you can join us. And guys, kind of a special edition, like I said, of the Nitwits. We've got a new head coach at Penn State. James Franklin introduced uh, last Saturday at a press conference. Let's kind of go around the table here and get some initial thoughts on James Franklin and what he brings to this Penn State football program, Neil. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was a guy that, uh, unlike two years ago when Bill O'Brien uh, took the job, uh, it seemed there were a lot of people that may have been wary of it, were kind of backing away. Bill accepted that challenge. Uh, I don't know that it was a job that he was necessarily uh, looking at for a long period of time before it opened. I think James Franklin clearly wanted this job and was very impressive and enthusiastic. And the thing that I took away uh, more than anything from the press conference is the confidence that he seems to have in the in the job and the in the in what he's going to do in this position. Yeah, the one thing that I would like to talk about is as much heat as Dave Joyner and Rod Erickson have taken, and some of it for me, uh, over a lot of things they've done. This is two times they've had a football coaching hire, and I think they've done a great job both times. Bill O'Brien, whether you're happy or sad that he left, uh, did a great job in his two years at Penn State, and clearly this guy was 1 or 1A, depending on who you talk to. I think he was the one guy that they wanted. I think Al Golden was the second guy. I think they could have had either one of those guys, and to be able to get a, a talent like James Franklin – uh, who a lot of other programs out there want, I think, was just really big for them. And Joe, that's a good point because mm -hmm. you look at James Franklin out there, and we followed this process for some time where he was the guy. He was, he was on a lot of guys. He was on a lot of teams' lists. He was on a few uh, you know, NFL franchises' lists. When Bill O'Brien initially came in, not a lot of people knew who Bill O'Brien was. They hired him. He comes in and does wonders with the program mm -hmm. in two years. Then he, you know, kind of builds it back up to where you can bring in a guy right. the caliber of James Franklin. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. I mean, two of them are obviously both hired on different on different situations. Uh, you know, Bill comes in in a damage control situation where, uh, you know, you got James coming in after the foundation has been laid. So, you know, what you were talking about, too, Mark, is love him or hate him. What he did was really tremendous on number one being the glue to hold the program together for that amount of time keeping the kids here then winning on top of that uh, so uh, there really shouldn't be any ill will towards towards Bill in my opinion um, he's doing what's best for him and we all knew that he was a, a, a pro coach I mean that's what he that's what he wanted to do he wanted to be in the league uh, you could tell by the contract structures and what he did in the second year we didn't we knew he was going to go we just didn't know when he was going to go now with Franklin coming in you got a completely different situation. Now you got the guy that can also play the political role in uh, college football as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about Bill O'Brien later in the show, but let's get back to something Neil said about the press conference on Saturday. And he, he, everything came up. You know, there were, he had a situation to James Franklin at Vanderbilt that was unfortunate for him last summer. Uh, that came up. Um, 
and he said all the right things. He, he certainly seems like a guy that's going to come in here. He's going to be that ambassador that they're looking for, and it looks like he's going to coach and win football games and have these kids on his side as well. Yeah, he seemed comfortable in that role. I don't know that Bill O'Brien – Bill O'Brien – said, I'm not the unity coach. So I think that role wore him down a little bit, particularly the second year. I think the first year, uh, he was real enthusiastic, uh, you know, went on the caravan, still did the caravan the second year, but I don't know that he was as enamored with some of those types of things. I think he was really uh, an excellent X and O person, and that was his real passion. And curious to see how he'll do uh, in the NFL. I think a lot of people here, uh, if they're not, I think they ought to be rooting for him. This guy could have left after his first year, and the program would have been set back 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we should lose sight of that. A couple things about Franklin. I mean, here's a guy, and, and everybody's talking about what a great face of the program is, which is true, but he also uh, did so well in the SEC, going to three straight bowl games, winning nine games the last two years. That is a great coaching job. And then you combine that with the fact that here he is for the national championship game out in Pasadena, on ESPN, doing just a great job on TV. You know, you, you put it all together, the recruiting, what he's able to do on the field, he's a young guy, the face of the program. He just seems like he's more prepared. And, and as Joe said, yeah, I think he, Bill made this a more attractive job. There's no question about it. But I think a guy like James Franklin is going to be able to come in and be much more comfortable being the quote-unquote face of the program. Yeah, saying it, Joe, saying it's your dream job right off the bat, I think says a lot about James Franklin. Yeah, the positive energy he's given and where we're at uh, with the community. I know uh, people feel a lot closer now to the program, maybe to the, to the university, than, than they did before. Again, they're two different personalities, Bill and himself. There are two different personalities. Uh, what, what I really like about Franklin and what he's doing is all the positive vibes you're getting. He, and again, he's saying all the right things, uh, doing all the right things, uh, but uh, you know now he's going to have to follow up with them. But again, with all that energy, we all know how it goes. I mean, you know, it's going to be – there's a lot of promises. He's undefeated. I mean, well, right. And there's, there's a lot of promises out there. And I, and I really uh, like the one quote when he asked a uh, guy uh, – mentioned uh the 90,000 he explained you know under seven I mean that's a that's a it, you know, that's a big promise and we all understand that because when you get some of these Akron's and some of these smaller games they're tough to load those stadiums up well they're adjusting their ticket that was another developer right. yes, came out point. this week they're going to have a floating ticket right uh you know the Ohio State game will cost a little bit more but some of it may be an opportunity to take you know, a bigger family to some of these games that haven't been exposed yeah. to Penn State football and, and be able to see, you know, sure. even if it is in Akron or, uh, you know, some of their non-conference schedule. And I like that idea better than piggybacking the games. I think some people kind of felt a little bit robbed on that as opposed, you know, having to do Eastern Michigan and Michigan. Uh, this one with the with the floating scale here, I think that makes it a little bit better and a little bit more cost. Yeah, the one thing I would I would ask everybody here, not to take over your role, Casey, but going into this, what was everybody's expectations? A newspaper guy, me, a web guy, you a TV guy? I, I can tell you that going into this, if, if somebody would have told me they were going to be able to get James Franklin, I would have said, end it right there. That's going to be a grand slam home run if they could do it. And I think it, from everything we've seen so far, yeah, he won the press conference. We know that. There's still a long way to go. But expectation-wise, and I, I got the same sense from the most of the fans that they're kind of feeling the same way. Well, i got to admit, when his name was you know, originally being thrown around with the Mike Munchaks and the Al Goldens and even the Greg Shianos of the world, I'm going, geez, James Franklin, the guy from Vanderbilt that's taken them, you know, a Vanderbilt program, basically, you know, out of the bottom and brought them back to relevance again? Geez, if you can get this guy, yeah. well, heck yeah. And sure enough, they end up in the end getting him. Hey, they, they beat Georgia, which should have beat Auburn. And, and Auburn had Florida State on the run. Mm -hmm. So to do that at Vanderbilt, to win at Florida, I know Florida is rebuilding now, to beat Tennessee, I mean, talk about a rising star and a guy on the way up. Uh, who's had recruiting experiences as much as uh, Mike Munchak would have been presidential. And, and uh, I admired his loyalty. Two years ago, they really needed him. <clears throat> he didn't do it, but he had only been the Texans coach for one year. And so, um, you know, I think you admire that loyalty, but at the end, and here, he didn't fire his staff, and then he got fired. Quickly, Joe, uh, and, and we'll take a break after this, but I, I, you, pro you didn't go through this back in the day, but some of these players talking to them, going through uh, now another head coach, which would be some of their, their third head coach. Um, when you have a guy like James Franklin bringing this energy in, 
how does that make a lot of these guys saying this is what you know this is what we need we're, we're used to this first of all because we've had a change in head coaches right. uh, a lot here at Penn State but to have a guy young passionate bringing the energy back uh what would that make you feel like as a player? Well, the, the best thing he has is all that positive energy going. He, yeah. he seems to be a real players coach. Okay, the guys like him. Seems like the community likes him. A lot of people are, are behind him. So when you start to have that kind of vibe and that kind of energy, um, that's one big plus. The second, then it's easier for them to buy in. And he can come in and take the leadership role. The kids buy in because now you're taking one system and having to learn another one. Not that that's that difficult. You still have to learn it, but they have to buy in. There's one thing running the place, another another thing buy in. So to them, they've already gone through the worst of the worst, someone that's maybe been there one or two years. So they've already been through the fire. Now they're looking at it like, okay, now we're going to finish up our college career or start our college career with this guy. Uh, and it seems to me as if all the players on, on uh, board right now and all the recruits come in are 100% bought in. And that's, that's, a, that's a big hurdle to get over as a new coach. You have to earn that respect immediately to your players or you know, you're going to scramble for a couple of years. Yeah. And real quick, I mean, uh, Dave Joyner, as you touched on, they, they said that they had, uh, were more thorough in this vetting process because there was an issue out there that some of the national media picked up and questioned why Penn State would be going in this direction. But uh, you know, they seem very satisfied with the amount of uh, – of background that they did. All right, guys, James Franklin takes over as Penn State's 16th head football coach all the time. we got to step out and take a break. Franklin taking over for now the former Bill O'Brien. We'll talk about how he kind of departed Penn State. We'll also talk about Larry Johnson, who's since moved on as well. Coming up next, you're watching. The Nitwits are brought to you by, by the Altoona Professional Hearing Aid Center, your hearing aid health care professional. By Monarch Cleaners, for all your cleaning needs. By your rehab choice, Health South of Altoona. Ask for us by name. By JP Auto, home of the thousand dollar push, pull, or tow. By Courtesy Motors of Altoona, where courtesy means a great deal. All right, and welcome back to the Nitwits. It is a special edition of the Nitwits. We're talking about Penn State's new head football coach, James Franklin. He's the 16th head football coach all time at Penn State. And uh, this is what an honor. What a special, unexpected treat. I cannot believe it. Appreciate you, James Franklin. Hey, you know, that was, you're not the first person that said that. <laughs> Hey, he's the first it person. Who's first stop in it was? Now you talk hey, about this. Is a, I'd like to share his contract. <laughs> That's not like to have part of that. So oh, hey, you know, been accused so, of looking like Franklin. So yeah, I've, you know, someone's told me that uh, before, but uh, you know, hey. Or has Franklin been accused of looking like you? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Wait, how old is he? Forty-one. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know. We could be brothers, huh? <laughs> well, hey, James Franklin takes over, of course, for Bill O'Brien, who's since departed for the NFL and the Houston Texans. Guys, what are your thoughts on kind of how? Coach O'Brien departed. Um, there was obviously the article published uh, that had a conversation with Coach O'Brien, said some things that he initially comes back and says he now regrets, but um, did a lot for this program, no question, in his two years here. You know, first of all, I thought the timing was just terrible. Uh, I don't think anybody begrudges him for going because we all knew that he was going to go to the NFL. Unfortunately, one of the tough things when you're dealing with NFL jobs anymore is you just can't keep it quiet. I can't believe that he imagined that this was going to get out on New Year's Eve the way it did. But how difficult must that have been for all the recruits all the players. I think he just put everybody in a bad spot, including him. He spent all night until 2 in the morning trying to catch up with these guys. But in terms of going, listen, wish him well. Uh, I hope he does well. But the timing of that, I don't know if it was the agent who leaked it. I don't know if it was the Texans. I just thought the timing was awful. Well, you know, I think we all got another lesson of what it's like with these NFL, uh, Mortensen and Schefter and Rappaport. And I don't know if there's second sources involved or not. But I mean, on Twitter, it's just an explosion. And once it got to be 3, 4 o'clock, I thought, surely the Texans have dismissed their staff on New Year's Eve. Yeah. And they're going to be, this may come up, we'll see about it on Thursday. Well, uh, we weren't so fortunate. But to the point of um, the remarks that he made to Dave Jones of the Patriot News, um, you know, and he, he has since said he regrets that. And I think that was really ill-timed. And, you know, Bill O'Brien was the first first-time head coach, and I think he learned a lot of uh, valuable lessons here, and that would have been one of them. I mean, you know, kind of on your way out the door to alienate, uh, it, it wasn't necessary. 
Yeah, yeah I, I mean, mean uh, you know, I, I couldn't say uh, too much more about the timing. Again, was really was really what was tough. Uh, we all knew it was coming. I don't think. I think a lot of us didn't want to believe it because we're, we're used to a certain way at Penn State, and we're used to the family atmosphere. And you know, you just don't turn your back on family. And I'm not saying that's what he did, but uh, that's what we're used to, and that's what I think we all felt. And when it happened, the way it happened, as quick as it happened, I, I believe that that's what really turned everybody angry or whatever you want. You know, the emotions really got high at that point in time. People said what they said on their Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Uh, but, again, we all knew it was coming. I, uh, my opinion, I thought it would have been between a four- and six-year period because I figured it would have worked towards the end of the sanctions. And then, you know, because we knew it was coming. But last year's um, setup with the contract and the way you renegotiated that, uh, the writing was on the wall there. It just we didn't feel it coming. Maybe this like this year. Maybe maybe in you know year four or whatever. And again, it was it was a lot of us wanting uh, the family. You know, yes, us yeah. meaning the community wanting the family is why I believe everybody got. Yeah, that's what's that. so tough about these <clears throat> NFL jobs. Mm-hmm. Though. I mean, you look at you know what he did in two years at Penn State. You got the Texans coming and calling. They're going to get the top pick in the draft. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there that benefits mm-hmm. him and. I, I think the comments that were made on that during that phone conversation, I think, is kind of what alienates the fan base a little yeah. bit and, ru- and ruffles some feathers. And one of the other things that goes back to the difference, and one of the differences between college and pro football is the fact that you're. I don't. I don't want to keep saying letting down, but again, you're in a recruit. You're always in a process. There's always right. a process. There's no. Where in the no NFL, time to leave. no. Right, right. In the NFL, uh, hired, fired. These guys are all paid. Everybody's a professional. Everybody's doing what they're doing. Uh, but in college, you're telling someone, this is what we're going to do. This Come to my university, Penn State University. Uh, this is what we do. And then you're not there when a the recruit comes in. Now it's a completely different dynamic. So that's where, again, that's why it's a tougher, fast-moving job. It's harder to be there two, three years and get you know, in and out. Now, I don't know all the background, but I think when uh, the, the exits – slash dismissals of Andrew Linden and Charlie Fisher, I thought kind of indicated that we were in for another year. I did, too. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, listen, I, I don't believe for a minute that he had made up his mind definitively. And if you read the story that was written, it did seem like he was still going back and forth at that point. I think everybody realized if the right job, the quote-unquote right job came along, uh, that he was going to take, and he viewed this as the right job. One thing about O'Brien that I thought was uh, just ultimately ironic is that he talked about not wanting to be the face of the program, not wanting to do this and that. Yet he was at his best when he was the face of the program during crisis situations. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when obviously when he was first hired, when the sanctions came down, when SI did the hatchet job on the medical staff. This guy stood up, and I thought it was just fantastic. Right. And, and I, I think, think if there were questions about him, it was more about his X's and O's. He, I, I I agree. He, he he excelled in those, but on the field, I think he was still learning. Right. I mean, but he was excellent at player development. Quarterback. Yeah. No, he was he was great with quarterbacks. He was great tight ends. But if you looked at some of the games that they lost, where they didn't adjust or they didn't make good halftime adjustments, and again, that's part of the learning process as a head coach. I just thought it was ironic that I hate this. I thought their offensive line and running game development uh, both years uh, were impressive. Now. <laughs> he totally went away from it against uh, Indiana, and I don't know what happened in that game. It just seemed like they just their minds were not there. I don't know what, but uh, most uh, I don't think he was just a passing coach. No, I think he was a good coach, but I do think there were a lot of areas where you could look at things and be fairly critical. You know, whether it was us, whether it was fans, and I'll bet you he was self-critical. And I just think it was amazing that he was sensational at the stuff he allegedly didn't like to do. <clears throat> what kind of success do we think he'll have the next level, Joe? You know, uh, that league, uh, you've seen some really, really good coaches. Well, take Tom Coughlin. I mean, here, here you got a guy with Super Bowl, and he's on a chopping block. I mean, it just that's the nature of that business. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much talent out there. I know there's talent in college ball, but you get the right horses in there, it's a different story. Now you got the, the NFL, and you've got, uh, you know, 20 of those 20, 25 teams that could win it any year. So and that, 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 again, is going to come down to organization, how they feel about them, what kind of long-term commitment they want to have, which – other than the Steelers, nobody has any. So, uh, you know, I, you know he, could he have two, three years there? If he wins in two or three, he'll have another Patrick three. McNair you know? seems to be a good owner. I could see where that is a, a good fit. And he didn't just – I'm surprised geographically he moved as far away, but it does seem to be a good organization. Well, we mentioned how good he's been with quarterbacks, and they've got a – 
quarterback situation there with Matt Schaub that um, who knows what's going to happen. Well, they're also the number one draft pick, yeah. so I think, I think that they're going to be okay there. I think the biggest question, and this is going to follow him throughout his career, because I think you could see some issues at Penn State, is what is he going to do in terms of defensive coordinator? I think they'll be fine offensively, but when you have a guy who's so offensive-minded, and he's basically the offensive coordinator, he was the offensive coordinator here, I think it's always going to depend on what sort of defensive coordinator they're going to be able to get in there to kind of be almost an assistant head coach, as it were. You know, not one of these assistant head coach in college things where they just give you the title. They're going to need somebody who's able And I saw it. I'm an Eagles fan. And I saw with Andy Reid, they had to get the right coordinator in there until that defense started playing well. Yeah. They really struggled. But, uh, Joe, does that not, not conflict you as a head coach when you're, all, when you're so focused on the, the offense? Yeah, yeah, me personally, I, I like to see coordinators on both sides of the ball. I think you can uh, game manage better as a head, head coach. You, you can take your role on better. Um, I understand it. Uh, I understand people want that control because they want to be able to call and they feel like they know it better than anybody. Yeah. And I completely understand that. But delegating an OC and a DC are, are definitely, in my opinion, the way to go because it allows you to work both sides of the ball uh, equally. I don't see him turning over the play calling. Uh, no, I don't. And that's where I'm telling you. You've, we've seen some instances in the NFL. The Cowboys had the issue with their coach, was a Garrett, who was calling the plays and they took it away from him. So I'm anxious to see how that translates. Chip Kelly does. Yeah, they, which Chip Kelly does it. Again, they had success this year, but how long are they going He's to good at it. I remember the, the introductory press conference because what we had gone through before – um, O'Brien said he was going to call the plays the first year. So I don't know whether he never developed the rapport with Charlie Fisher or he just didn't mm-hmm. want to give that up uh, because I thought that was his intention to eventually pass it along. Mm-hmm. So Bill O'Brien out, James Franklin in. What will Coach Franklin do as far as assistants are concerned now in his staff here at Penn State? Uh, we do know that one longtime assistant, Larry Johnson, has since moved on. We'll talk a little bit about that. Coming up next, you're watching the Nitwits. The Nitwits are brought to you by, by the Allegro, where fun cuisine is a way of life. By easytouse.com, your Yellow Pages connection in print and online. By fightonstate.com, as close as you get to Penn State football without putting on a helmet. And by the Altoona Mirror, featuring Penn State game day every Friday. All right, welcome back to the Nitwits, guys. We're uh, tackling all the issues or new things, I guess, regarding Penn State football, special edition. Nia Riddell, Joe Nassas, Mark Brennan. And uh, we got to talk about Larry Johnson because Larry Johnson, longtime assistant, spent 18 years at Penn State, 14 of which uh, last 14 as a defensive line coach. Joe, he's moving on to the Ohio State Buckeyes. What did you initially think when you heard that? Well, when, you know, I, to me, I'm a personal um, – friend of the family, uh, the kids, and uh, LJ himself, and any time I'd go up to the pro, I'd always go see him first, because, uh, well, one of the reasons, you know, he, he was, uh, he came in, I believe it was my sophomore year, and, you know, I've just had a relationship with him since, uh, you know, since he got here, and always been outstanding, great friend, uh, I could go to him for anything, uh, I know uh, Tony and uh, Larry well, and, uh, you know, to me, this was a situation where, uh he could have been a head coach, applied, applied again, felt that he was, uh, I don't want to say overlooked the first time, but then the second time it was like, okay, here I am, and this is what I can do. And to me, for him to be offered a job and stay there, I completely understand the situation. Him going to Ohio State, it would have been the same. If it, in his mind, it wasn't that he was going to Ohio State because that's somewhat of our rival now. It's him going to Ohio State because that's where it fit and that's where he could grow. So, to me, I know there was uh, some some words out there said that were – you can't dislike the guy. I mean, he's, he's an outstanding human being. He's an outstanding coach, great great recruiter. Uh, I can't say anything positive about him. And uh, I, I'm just happy for him. Do I wish he didn't go to one of our rivals? Yes, I do. But happy for him, yes. I, I would rather him gone to a, you know, Florida many, State maybe. You know? How many places, though, could he have gone that would have been an upgrade for him? And, right. you know, I know it's uh, it's maybe not the smoothest of transition, but, you know, he was not only overlooked for head coach. He, he had, you know, he wasn't the coordinator either. Right. So right. he gave him 18 years. He, he did very, very good work. I think he's on a short list of one of the better 
assistant coaches they've ever had. Uh, you know, I, I wish him well. I, and, and, you know, he's in a competitive industry. There's a lot of us that we've been in. Yeah. I've been in one newspaper town my whole uh, career. Uh, you know, sometimes if you ask yourself, you know, if you're not totally satisfied in your workplace, would you go to a potential competitor? And a lot of us haven't necessarily had a competitor yeah. to do that. Some so of us have. I, yeah. I, I, think, I think with what you're saying, too, about the I wasn't move, thinking of you. <laughs> about the move, there was if, if the coordinator position would, I, I think you would have had your, I think you would have been right here. Uh, and I agree with what you're saying. It would have been, if it would have been moving up as opposed to just a D-line coach, um, I think in a coordinator spot, he definitely would have been in the blue-white next year. You know, and I've talked about this a lot of different places, and I want to say a couple things first. Number one, Larry Johnson was great for Penn State football. Yes. Number two, Larry Johnson was great for Penn State University. Number three, Joe Nastassi knows this because you live up in State College. Great for the community. There's absolutely no question about it. Uh, all that said, and I'm not going to come back with a negative, this guy gave all of those years to Penn State, and when it became clear that he's never going to be the head coach there, and there have to be questions of whether he'll be defensive coordinator, I'm sure he saw it as time to move on. Now, sure. listen, do you want to take issue with him going to Ohio State if you're a fan? Sure, you can do that. That's part of it. That's part of the whole rivalry thing. But I'll also say that Urban Meyer was smart enough to realize the situation was going on and probably made him a really good offer sure. and realizes not only are you taking away a really good assistant coach, but you're probably going to impact him recruiting-wise. Uh, you know, maybe to do some players on the team have some second thoughts. So I just think this is another one of those things that people have to get used to that, you know, with coaches going to the NFL, NFL with with coaches within a conference being more aggressive toward other programs, that sort of thing. Sure. And how about for recruiting? I mean, you talk, you look at the list of guys that Larry single handedly had a huge um, factor in recruiting over the years, keeping everybody in, kind of like yeah, well, head coach. I think you have to look at it two ways. Number one, with this class, you know, they've already for, from as far as we can tell, they've lost a Holly kid to Florida. Mm-hmm. He didn't fall in Ohio State, which is probably a good thing for Penn State. Mm-hmm. But I think they're going to be over okay overall. The one thing that I think is important is that James Franklin has a great recruiting history in a lot of the same areas that LJ was, was great at. So I think with the power of Penn State behind him, they're going to be fine in those areas. I don't, I don't view this as some sort of death blow for Penn State and, and for recruiting. I, and you, you hit on something. We're not used to it. They not only had a head coach that never left, their assistants were generally fitted with cement shoes, and they never left either. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you you didn't see this. And the fact that he's uh, he's moving on, to me it makes sense because Franklin really doesn't know him. He could have appointed him defensive coordinator, but, you know, he's 41 years old. Neil, not only doesn't he know him, they were clashing on the recruiting trail. I'm not saying they were they were Franklin. Wanting to to have his own guys and, and giving him uh, the most you know the best shot in, in his mind at, at succeeding. And I, I think I think that's a great point. I mean, it, it was one of those situations where in, in such a short period of time, the turnover. So even going back to to you know when O'Brien was hired. I mean, initially with how long Joe had been at Penn State. Right. I mean, now a lot of things. And it kind of goes back to what we talked to in the first, about in the first segment. Sure. How you view that as a player. Yeah. But it seems like. Everybody is staying intact. And it's just, I mean, I think it was C.J. Olani said earlier this week that we've been through this. Mm-hmm. We've been through this. Does it stink? Yeah, it stinks. But we've been through this. We know how to handle this. Right. It's about keeping everybody intact, specifically the young players. They've been through worse than yeah. Well, let's, yeah. not, let's not forget yeah. that Larry Johnson was the one common theme from, you know, when, when right. at the end of Joe's career to the beginning of this career, and as much as people want to credit Bill O'Brien, rightfully so, with keeping everything together, Larry Johnson played a huge role in that. So if you're a fan and you want to be upset with Larry Johnson to go to Ohio State, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would suggest that also give him credit for what he did with the program and keeping this program together through all the difficult times. Plus, he stayed a couple times. He almost went to Illinois a few years ago, and I think Ohio State was looking at him a couple of years ago. Joe, especially when you listen to Larry Johnson, he was available to the media before I think he had his first interview for the head coaching vacancy, and you could tell. I mean, I mean, you were there, you were there. You could tell in his voice that he this this was a job that he yeah. really wanted. Yeah, he he bleeds it. I mean, just from the community, from that this is this is a place this is a place he loves. Uh, a university he gave a lot to. Um, they got a lot from from Larry, and uh, you know, uh, I just. Uh, 
really part of me. I'm, I'm really excited. It's like a, I don't want to say a bittersweet, but it's almost like that. You know, having a guy like uh, James coming in, sure, uh, or you yourself, know, yeah, or sure, <laughs> yeah, throw the glass. I still can't tell. I still get the glass on. Yeah, but uh, I, you know, I just again, it's uh, I really would have liked to have seen him here. I really would have. Uh, again, just being personal friends, I, it, it's kind of a little bit of a conflict. But again, uh, I'm happy with the direction we're going. I wish he would would be here with us. Uh, but uh, great man, he'll, he'll be successful yeah. out there. Let's just hope he doesn't impact us too much over here. You know, a lot, of, a lot of current former players share that same sentiment as uh, Joe and Stassi. Gentlemen, this was fun. Any, any final closing thoughts, Neil? Well, it's been an eventful our fix. off season. Uh, you ma- imagine if there was a bowl to cover right. uh, when you were dealing and juggling with some of these things. But uh, hey, James Franklin, first game he gets is Ireland. Yeah, one other thing. I, yeah, one other thing I would like to throw in is that the. Uh, I love the way the former players, you know, Joe, you you as well, kind of rallied behind this guy right off the bat. You heard the LeVar Arringtons and Blackledges and people from different generations and different backgrounds coming in and rallying behind this guy. This is the best family. family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That wasn't the case previously, and understandably so, because everybody was so emotional at the time. And I just think it's going to be make life so much easier for James Franklin than it was for Bill O'Brien at the start. No question. Well, without Penn State football for a little time, uh, check out Mark Brown on FinalState.com. Check out Neil Riddell's work in the Altoona here. Joe, we appreciate it as well. Stop by as always. And uh, thanks to the Access Channel. Thank you very much to the Access Channel. for us. Yep. Indeed, no question. Now, that'll do it for this edition. Of the thanks for joining us for Joe Nastassi, Neil Riddell, Mark Brennan, I'm Casey Kant, everybody here at the Access Channel. Have a good one. The Nitwits have been brought to you by Irwin Financial, Raymond James, an independent firm and firm foundation for your financial future. Coldwell Banker. No one will work harder to sell your home. By Drs. Howells and Reed, orthodontics for children and adults. By Pacifico's Bakery, genuine Italian bread and rolls for your tailgating needs. By Fiori True Value on 6th Avenue in Altoona, just ask rental. By the Altoona Professional Hearing Aid Center, your hearing aid healthcare professional. By Monarch Cleaners, for all your cleaning needs. By your rehab choice, Health South of Altoona. Ask for us by name. By JMP Auto, home of the $1,000 push, pull, or tow. By Courtesy Motors of Altoona, where courtesy means a great deal. By the Allegro, where fine cuisine is a way of life. By easytouse.com, your Yellow Pages connection in print and online. By fightonsake.com. As close as you get to Penn State football without putting on a helmet. And by the Altoona Mirror, featuring Penn State game day every Friday. You can also see the nitwits on altoonamirror.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.